Welcome to the I-29 Moo U Dairy Podcast. I-29 Moo University is a consortium of land-grant universities in Minnesota, Iowa, South Dakota, and Nebraska. This podcast covers timely news, information, and research for today's dairy industry. So welcome everyone to our I-29 Moo University podcast. In this podcast, we're going to be talking about kind of maintaining positive mental health And since it is May, Mental Health Month, and I'm joined here today actually by two of my 29 colleagues, Fred Hall and Jen Bentley. Do you guys want to introduce yourself? Good afternoon. My name is Fred Hall. I'm a dairy specialist in Western Iowa. Well, glad to be back on the podcast, and I think this will be a a good topic, very timely as always, and um, I'm a dairy field specialist housed in Northeast Iowa. And our guest today is Andrea I'm sure I'll get your name wrong. Bjornstead. Is that close? She's a... um, perfect. Why don't you introduce yourself, Andrea, and tell us a little bit about you and your role there at South Dakota State. Sure. My name is Andrea Bjornstead, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Counseling and Human Development at South Dakota State University, where I'm also the mental health specialist in SDSU Extension. And so I would say for about, since 2015, I have been working with farmers and ranchers on their mental health, and um, I'm an invited speaker uh, on the topic, as well as I have conducted numerous studies related to stress, depression, anxiety, and suicide risk among um, producers. So I think, Andrea, as you were mentioning earlier, before we were on the air, the the difference between mental illness and mental health, maybe that's a good place to start off is kind of, I think people do get those really confused. So tell us a little bit about those two definitions. Sure. The terms are often used interchangeably, but they're very different. So mental health is really our optimal state of well-being, and we should all strive for optimal mental health. So it's our ability to function in normal daily activities, our ability to cope well with different stressors and and be productive as members of our communities and our families and those sorts of things. Um, Mental illness is a diagnosable medical condition. And so you do need to meet certain criteria um, for a mental illness. However, a lot of people go undiagnosed um, and, and struggle with depression or anxiety or or d- other mental illnesses on their own. Um, and you have difficulties in certain areas of functioning in, in your life. And um, so again, it's a, it's a medical illness, uh, medical condition, whereas mental health is our ability to cope with everyday stressors. So what are the items that people tend to struggle with kind of on a daily basis? I mean, as as you look around, and I think all of us, and along with that, what percent of people at some point in their life or over the course of a year uh, have mental health? Because there's still this stigma, it seems like to me, that we just can't talk about mental health or mental illness or anything around that. So I, I think it's more common, at least than I maybe think it is. Well, um, you know, the statistics kind of vary on where you look, but some um, organizations report that one out of every four uh, individuals suffers from a mental illness. Now, I, I must say, I, the stigma is still present. However, I do think that we're making some improvements. And, and you know, I would say the positive thing out of COVID was people started talking more about mental health at times. You know, I don't know about all of you, but I had moments where I was really struggling. I was balancing kids and work and trying to educate, you know, being a teacher (laughs) while um, being socially isolated, a heightened sense of universality and cohesion that we weren't alone, that kind of everybody was struggling. And the CDC actually reported a decrease in suicide, the suicide rate during this time. I think the stigma is still existing, but I think we've made some progress and and within the farming communities, uh, some of the most recent reports are are stating that there's more, there is more of a willingness to talk about stress now. You know, we always talk about the stress, but this morning I was in an alfalfa field and the dairyman running the planet, come over the fence and we're visiting. He'd been up for 30 hours. He hadn't eaten yet today. So what are some of the things that we just got to do for ourselves to 
to maintain our health and especially our mental health during these kind of stressful times. I think self-care is very important. Although we feel like we need to go 110 miles per hour all the time. And it sounds like that that's what that producer was feeling, right? I need to get this done. I need to, I need to work through it. And some of it is just self-care. So whether it's getting out of the tractor for five minutes and, and going for a short walk, making sure that maybe there's a plan that somebody brings food out um if, if there is somebody within the family that can bring food to make sure that nutrition and you're eating during that time sleep is so important we you know a couple of years ago i was at a fair where a producer came up to me and he said i have not been sleeping and i ran my tractor through a fence the other day because i fell asleep during the day so some of it is really although we feel like we need to go 110 miles per hour what are the repercussions of something like that happening if we don't take care of ourselves so sleep going to bed at the same time every night um waking up at the same time every day uh nutrition maintaining our regular routines positive self-talk is important during stressful times and i know that can be difficult because we kind of when we're stressed out we have that tendency to move into a negative thought cycle pattern of oh, this isn't going well. And pretty soon this won't go well. And, and it just keeps going. So really focusing on the positive self-talk and reframing those negative situations into something positive. Well, thinking about, well, what is going well? Although this is going poorly, what is something that I can focus on that's going well? Making sure you talk about your feelings, don't hold them inside your worries, your stress. So it sounds like with that producer not sleeping, maybe there's a lot of anxiety about getting things done, lots of worries, just making sure that you're talking to somebody about all those things are important. And Andrea, you've probably heard the saying, when mama isn't happy, nobody's happy, right? So um, that's probably the same with farmers, moms, dads, and we try to build this resiliency within our family, right? So that Thing, negativity doesn't filter down to our kids, down to family members. How do we manage that? Yeah, I talk a lot about how children can feel our stress. So for example, when I'm horribly stressed out, I, I tend to get irritable. So if mom gets irritable, what happens to the kids, right? They can follow the same pattern or they may re retreat. They might take, they might say, okay, I'm going to take mom on tonight because she's irritable. I'm going to be irritable too. So it is important to make sure that we're watching our stress signs and symptoms and what those look like because our children feel our stress. Even our little ones, our toddlers can feel our stress. So as far as resilience in the family, um, making sure you schedule family time. I know that can be difficult in a farm family, but family meetings, you know, I've worked with a farm family once that was really struggling with communication. And so they started having family meetings in the morning during breakfast and making breakfast time, um, that opportunity to discuss the daily operation. What does the operation look like today? What are we going to accomplish? It can be so difficult when the farm family operation intersects with the family, right? We have multiple dynamics happening. So making sure that there is a separation between family time and maybe farm operation time. Go on, spend some time as a marital couple. If you're married, um, go on a date, try to, I know that that sometimes are busier than others, but what we find is that sometimes that relationship is lost. If time isn't made for the relationship, making sure you talk to your children take the time to listen, ask certain questions such as what was the favorite part of your day? Who did you sit by at lunch? You know, little, little questions like that. Uh, what do you enjoy most at home? What could be done differently? What could change? Um, what are some things that mom and dad could do differently? So maintaining that open communication. So I'm a real advocate for family meetings and family time. How often would you suggest those, Andrea? I mean, uh, I like that's an idea. Do you do that weekly, daily? What kind of habit you could you develop? Well, I, I would say, obviously, open communication with one another is a daily habit. We should get into paying attention to body language, paying attention to 
all the stress signs and symptoms of each other. What's very interesting is when I talk with farm families, the producer will say, well, these are my stress signs and symptoms and the spouse will pop on. Well, well, we'll say, well, what about these? So sometimes we don't notice everything that's going on with ourselves. So I would say open communication daily, but family meetings and family time is a weekly thing. So shifting gears a little bit here, Andrea, how do we deal with people that, you know, we always, all of us, whether it's a colleague or maybe a family member, just some people are just more a lot more optimistic and upbeat than other ones are. How do we either interact with people that maybe tend to be a little bit more on a negative or pessimistic side, whether it's because I, as you mentioned, they tend to drag us all down also, or they can drag you down, or maybe I'm the person being negative. Heck, who knows? Um, maybe friend Jen could answer that better than anybody else. But how do you interact with people like that? And or if you kind of catch yourself being negative, is there any kind of tools or anything you would suggest that that we can catch ourselves or interact with people like that to kind of help bring them along? Sure. I tend to be more of an optimistic person. And so I, I'll catch any negative thoughts. So If a friend were to say something and is in a negative thought cycle pattern, I reframe it into something different. So let's say you're driving in a car and somebody is going super slow and you're in a hurry and it's very frustrating to you. And so you might say a few choice words or call names or something like that. And I tend to be the type of person that thinks, well, maybe that person is just having a rough day and is really deep in their thoughts. So you reframe it into something that's a different situation for the person. Well, have you thought about this differently? Have you thought about this perspective? So that's what I would challenge anyone to do is to look at it from a different perspective. Setting boundaries is important. So if you're surrounded by people who are negative all the time, make sure you set those boundaries Don't be afraid to walk away and take some deep breaths because sometimes, you know, if, if people are constantly negative, we have a hard time keeping our mouth shut, right? So walking away, respond calmly, be firm with your boundaries. And again, really focus on that positive well, and try to spin it into a different perspective. James, does that give you something to think about? Looking at yeah, things. I think I'll have to think now, Jim, what are you thinking? What's your brain going on here? Because I think we all tend to be that a little bit way once do. in a while. You know, I think everybody does. Um, and, you know, we'd, we'd be lying to ourselves if we didn't have negative thoughts or negative opinions at times. And, you know, in society within the past year or so, people on social media, there's a lot of debates happening about certain issues and, and social media can be a very negative place. And so really setting those boundaries of how often you look at social media, are you engaging in these discussions and is it a helpful engagement or is it a hurtful engagement? I I guess that's the big question to ask yourself. And I also come from a perspective where I seek to understand somebody's constantly negative. I seek to understand what's going on with that person that they're constantly negative because a lot of times it's not what's on the surface. It's something that's much deeper. Sort of tying into that. um, What are some things? So I'm interacting with somebody in my family and they're just kind of not themselves. Oh, and not for a day, you know, it's kind of going on and on. What, number one, what, what are the signs you would look for? And then how do you help that person that might be struggling? And they're just, they're just kind of out of sorts. It could be a family member, it could be a friend, or it could be a neighbor. What would be your suggestion on what you could do to kind of get them out of that funk? Sure. Some signs um, to look for would be stress signs can be very similar to symptoms of depression or anxiety. And so you're looking for excessive worrying or fear. So maybe a lot of conversation about anxious thoughts, again, going that 110 miles per hour and not, not calming down. Um, but you can also have the opposite end where somebody's really struggling to get out of bed. Somebody's really struggling to be motivated, feeling excessively sad or low. Maybe um, you have a family member who uh, just doesn't look like themselves. They, they've had a drastic change in mood, kind of going back to that irritability if someone's constantly angry all the time. You can also see some cognitive changes such as confused thinking, difficulties with decision making, maybe some confused thinking, extreme mood changes. I kind of talked about those with the irritability, the highs or the lows. A big red flag to me is social isolation. So if all of a sudden they have um, withdrawn from 
the family or withdrawn from their social circle, that is definitely something that needs to be discussed. Any changes in sleeping, maybe you're not sleeping enough or sleeping too much and eating can also be a sign of some changes too. There are a lot you guys to look for an increase in substance use. So when I talk with producers at different ad events, I always have a few come up to me and tell me about stories of, of suicide. And a lot of them say, well, we saw some changes. They started drinking a little more and became more withdrawn, but we always thought that he would come and talk to us about about it. And he never did come and talk to us. So that's where you ask what you can do is I encourage people to approach the person and say, you know what, I really care about you. And I've noticed some changes in you lately. And then you list the changes, list the changes, because that adds some detail to your conversation. You're not just coming out of nowhere with your concerns. It's, you know, over time I've noticed these changes and I'm really concerned about you and give them the opportunity to kind of elaborate on it. So notice the changes, ask them if they're willing to receive some help and don't hesitate to ask the suicide questions of, have you had thoughts of killing yourself? Um, do you have a plan? I know you wanted to keep this update and I'm changing it a little bit, but but those would be the questions to ask if you have that gut feeling that something more is going on. Sometimes it's really hard to know at what point is it really a problem. And Jen, I know you're involved with QPR. Can you kind of walk us through how that would help us? Yeah, well, I think Andrea said, you know, a lot of good points already. You know, QPR is the question, persuade, refer. So just like Andrea said, asking those questions, letting them know that you are concerned about them and then notice the changes of behavior. And Andrea, you mentioned persuade. So how can I help you? Where can we get resources for help? Refer. So that's, you know, getting them to those resources, getting them to the help that they need. So, you know, that's asking the question, I think kind of spot on there is it never hurts to ask the question, are you okay? You look unhappy. Can we get you some help? It can be a very direct approach. It could be very indirect approach, but just recognizing those signs. And again, Andrea went through a lot of the behavior changes that are common. And obviously you're going to know that person better than, um, you know, if it's a close friend or family member, you're going to know a lot of those significant changes pretty suddenly. Yeah. And I get a lot of questions about, well, a lot of comments about how they're scared they're going to say something wrong. And it's not about whether or not you're going to say anything wrong, because lots of times what people remember is that somebody even asked and somebody even sat with them during a time in which they're hurting really, really bad. And so it's joining with their vulnerability with some empathy and recognizing that they are struggling. Sometimes that even in itself makes a difference that that person centered humanistic side of things of I'm going to sit with you during this difficult time and I'm going to be here for you. Yeah, I think follow up is very key too. you know, a phone call, a text message, however you communicate or however that person communicates, just make sure you follow up and show that you are there and are caring for them. I'm going to shift gears a little bit here, Andrea, and I was just thinking about my my life, I'm kind of an avid exerciser if you hang out with me. And the reason I exercise, I mean, it's just, for me, it's who I am. It's every single day. And I do that to maintain good physical health. I mean, that's one of my motivating factors to do that. There must be habits that people could develop to help them maintain good mental health. I don't know what those are, but I would suspect that you probably know what those are, Andrea. So what can every single listener do that we can develop a habit to maintain really good mental health or as good as it can be? Well, everybody's different. That's the thing. And, and James, you mentioned that you exercise for physical health. Well, I exercise and I, I'm a daily person too. I do it for my mental health. And so when I talk to different groups, I have them say what they do to manage their stress. So I get a lot of different answers, such as, you know, going for a drive and listening to music. Uh, maybe they journal 
Uh, a lot of them read the Bible, uh, meditate, deep breathing, exercising, going for walks, spending time with loved ones, maybe going to a movie, engaging in a hobby. And then I have some that say, well, I don't really manage my stress. I don't have something that I do. And the thing is, is that I could say, you know, exercise has been, you know, research and there and has shown to be effective in reducing depression. But if you hate to exercise, it's only going to contribute to more stress, right? So you do have to figure out something that you enjoy in order to manage your stress. So again, maybe it's going to art classes or, or singing, um, dancing, but there are so many different things that you can do to manage your stress as long as it's enjoyable and it's something that you're willing to engage in, hopefully on a daily basis to help you manage it. So how do you but do that, Andrea? Because I think sometimes you get in this funk where you just don't, I, I think when you get depressed or you kind of get down, you don't want to do anything oftentimes. I mean, you don't want to interact with anybody. You just kind of close yourself off. Do you just beat yourself over the head and say, I got to do this. What can people do? Well, some of it is positive self-talk. You know, there are times where I get horribly stressed and maybe I'm on a, you know, on a scale of one to 10, 10 meaning I'm the most stressed I've been. Maybe I'm at a seven and I've crawled into a hole where I don't want to talk to anyone for about a week. And I would say that most of the time that's fine. As long as you recognize that it's happening and you're able to pull yourself out of it. So if it's for longer than two weeks, then it's time to seek professional help. But you really, you know, exercise to me, there are some days I don't want to exercise, but I know it's my method of stress relief. And I know that I become this irritable monster that my kids don't want to be around, right? If I don't exercise. So some of it is thinking about how am I in relation to what's happening in my life and what works for me to pull myself out of this mood I'm in. And so some of it is positive self-talk that, Hey, I can do this. Looking at the positive side of things. I talked about those positive perspectives earlier, but sometimes it is forcing yourself a little bit to do the strategy that works. I, you know, the strategy that you enjoy, even though at the moment you may not enjoy it. I know I sounded like I contradicted myself, but I did, you know, sometimes we do have to force ourselves to do our enjoyable stress relief. (laughs) Well, sometimes I hear that, well, I'm outside working outside all day. Shouldn't I feel good because I'm working outside? And I think, yes, you are working outside. You are out in nature, but are you really recognizing your surroundings? And so taking some time to think about "Hmm, maybe I should go fishing or kayaking or something that I can really actually enjoy nature rather than thinking about what I have to do outside or what I have to do to get done, you know, with my work life. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes we have to ground ourselves in those senses, our senses of being very mindful of what's around us. Because if if you do work in an outside job, how often are you taking the time to stop and smell, you know, smell um, what, what are we touching? You know, uh, we talked about mindful walking. So feeling our feet when they, when it touches the ground, how many times do you close your eyes and take some deep breaths and just listen, listen to nature while you're working outside. So there are ways, like you said, where you're connected to nature, you should be feeling good in nature, but if you don't take the time to connect your senses to nature, um, it might not be as effective in, in reducing your stress. I think you're right. I got a dog that I go walking with too. And I, one of the things that I do and my wife thinks I'm obsessed with this dog. Maybe I am, maybe I'm not, I don't know. But I said, she brings me joy because she is always happy. I mean, for me, pets really do because they are always in a good mood, no matter what, what kind of mood I'm in, by golly, her tail will wiggle and she'll be happy to see me. So I think you're right, Andrea. And and my wife scratches my head thinking, what the heck? It's a dog. So I think we each have to find what brings us joy in our life. I, I think that's, I think there's a lot of truth in that. So Fred, what brings you joy in your life? Other than those shorthorn cattle you got. There you go. Blue ribbons and tan bark. That, that's <laughs> a joyful experience for me. And Jen, you know, with your kids, I'm suspecting it's your children because you're just at that fun age where you're really, yeah. really, they, they bring a lot of stress because you're so busy. But at the same time, I think 
they just, at least my children really, when they were all home, brought a lot of joy to my life. Yeah, they, you know, their activities, what they're involved with, just seeing them grow definitely brings great joy. Uh, things that I enjoy kind of by myself is gardening. I just love to dig in the dirt and plant flowers, plant vegetables. That's kind of my time to get away. Do you think, mm-hmm. Andrea, I think this is going to be a personal counseling session, maybe for me, but I think sometimes all of us feel like we need to be busy 24 hours a day or we're not really living life. And then you mentioned, you look on social media, everybody else is in a different country enjoying a beautiful view in Greece or somewhere. Even with things you enjoy, can you be too busy with things you enjoy that it actually adds stress to your life? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and to be honest with you, I am a licensed professional counselor, but I won't turn this into a counseling session, no worries. You know, my kids are in so many sports right now, and they are it's fun to watch them play, right? But they're on traveling teams, and so I, I literally spend every weekend going somewhere to some other city to watch them play their sports, and it gets overwhelming, and it gets stressful. So absolutely, you can overwhelm yourself with things that you enjoy, And you mentioned that, especially in the United States, we do work ourselves to death, right? Um, We are not great at setting boundaries and um, really living in the moment. And, you know, I've hit the age where I, I think I'm at, I think I'm at the point where I'm not going to allow my work to run my life. And I think you have to make the conscious decision that that's what you're going to do. Otherwise it will, you know, uh, whether academia or, or we're farming and ranching, you have to make the conscious decision that their boundaries are needed in order to live and actually live in the moment of being aware of, of life. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that's a good point, Andrea. And I, Fred and Jen, I'd like to hear your comments on this because when I, I've been an extension for, you know, about 25 years or so. And when I started, it was really a badge of courage that a farmer had not missed a milking in 25 years. I mean, that was, boy, that was a bad, and if you, if you went on vacation, you really weren't a real dairy farmer. And I really see that changing, especially among younger families. And sometimes that creates conflicts, intergenerational conflicts, because the younger generation might want to do something. I don't know, Fred and Jen, have you seen that, which I think is a really good positive change. You know, young people will say, no, that's the last thing I want to be proud of is that I never got to a kid's event because I haven't missed a milking in 10 years. So I think that's gotten better. Fred, Jen, do you have any comments? I would yeah. agree. I, my two brothers are operating a dairy and they have young families. And I've seen kind of that shift over the last few years of, they want to be there at their kids' sporting events. And that's definitely a change from maybe even when I was growing up, my parents were home every day doing every single milking shift. And now we're trying to be flexible with, you know, who we hire to make sure that we can get to all those events. You know, one of the dairymen I've worked with happened to be in Michigan. And when his girls were old enough to be in school sports and plays and that, he said, that's important to me and I'm not going to miss it because of tanks that would be in the family. So he melts at noon and midnight. He says, I can sleep in till nine o'clock, but I can attend every sporting event the girls are in. I can go to the theater, go on a date night, and it doesn't create a problem. So I think, yeah, we're, we're viewing families differently than when we were growing up. And I, I am conducting focus groups across South Dakota right now. And one of the conversations that has emerged is with our older farmers is a sense of regret that they did not engage themselves as much in, with their kids as they should have. Whereas the younger producers are saying, hey, I'm working to engage. I might not make it to everything, but I'm trying to make it to something. So I I think I'm hearing the same things that all of you guys are seeing too. As we kind of wind down uh, the podcast, I'm going to shift gears and ask, uh, maybe it'll lead to a bunch of questions, but 
you know, we've talked about identifying and after something's happened, you know, whether it's a, a barn fire or suicide or whatever trauma hits the family, how should we start working with families after the fact? I do think it needs to be a community effort of coming together and really trying to provide resources to that family and wh whatever that looks like, whatever the traumatic event entails. Um, so providing that resources and making sure that you stay connected, checking in, because oftentimes, you know, if, if there is a, a death in a family, um, sometimes a lot of resources are provided pretty early and then it just plain disappears. So how do we maintain that connection for time, you know, beyond that week after, after the death, having, you know, maybe it's an awful thing where a child is involved. Usually, you know, a crisis team is implemented within the community to offer the additional uh, support to other kids, family members, that sort of thing. So um, lots of times it's a crisis team effort, but as a community, make, making sure that that connection is maintained. Thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, we've sure had a great discussion uh, for this podcast. Any closing comments you'd like to leave the listeners with? I would just say, you know, if you're struggling just don't hesitate to talk to somebody, find somebody that you trust, somebody that you feel is willing to listen. And if there isn't that person, there are numerous hotlines that are available in the Midwest that you can call and, and someone's right there to listen and stay connected with you. So again, if you're struggling, don't hesitate to reach out. And if you know of somebody that is struggling don't hesitate to reach out to them either and sit with their vulnerability. Thank you very much. I know all of our extension groups have a lot of information available. We'll include some of those links with this podcast. I'd like to thank Jen Bentley and Jim Salfer for working today with this podcast. Uh, thank all of our listeners who joined the I-29 New University Dairy Podcast. I-29 MUU is an equal opportunity provider for the full non-discrimination statement or accommodation inquiries. Go to extension.iastate.edu forward slash diversity forward slash ext.